Empire. Where is the smart tech money being invested? When we think about sports tech, we think about this, you know, famous word that they've been saying since you and I were young professionals, which is convergence. I think we finally have seen it, right? Which is sports and media and technology have finally converged to create opportunities in specific parts of the sports landscape. That's Steve Murray, managing partner at Revolution Growth, where a pandemic and modern tech have opened up new ideas for funding. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. Steve Murray was an early entry into some of the most prominent tech and specifically sports tech spaces. You'll hear about that, but things have changed. Engagement metrics are becoming more and more necessary for funding, and the unusual times that we live in have opened the door for many companies who want to help teams and the public navigate COVID and other health issues. Our guest this week is Steve Murray, who is the managing partner at Revolution Growth. Let's, let's take a look at the investment side of sports technology in and around a pandemic. Hey, Steve, how are you? I'm great, Bram. How are you? I'm great. Um, let me start broadly with you. Um, what the last year and a half, two years from your point of view of what was investable in sports, what sports was doing, how they were navigating, what was this very unique time in our history, the closing down of a lot of team sports, the reopening now and still navigating a pandemic. Yeah, for sure. And and let me give you a little bit of background of the perspective that I have. So um, I work at a firm called Revolution. Um, Revolution was started 15 years ago by uh, Steve Case when he left AOL as a family office. And then about 10 years ago, it became an institutional platform. And if you looked at it today, they would you would see three different fund groups, mostly differentiated only by stage. So a seed stage fund, a venture stage fund, and a growth stage fund. Um, Revolution. So, in addition to having uh, you know different stages of a purview, um, I, I manage the growth stage fund. But we have uh, on the growth stage fund one of our partners is Ted Leonsis. Ted owns the Capitals and the Wizards, and he's also been quite active in esports and some other things. And so, you know, we've seen literally. I think it was March 13th when the NBA uh, season shut down. I think two days later the NHL season shut down. So, on some level, sports really led. Uh, the country and sort of uh, buttoning up and taking the pandemic seriously and closing down venues and the like. And then with the the bubble that happened uh, a summer ago when the NHL and the N NBA had their playoff bubbles, again, they started to lead on terms of, you know, how can you reopen some of these things in a safe way and create uh, places where people could begin to start to get back to, to normal. And I think you're now seeing, you know, again, with both uh, professional and college sports, they're beginning to lead people back into venues and figuring out ways to do that safely. And initial with, initially with less folks perhaps coming in and masks and every state and, and city is different, but uh, uh, it's starting to happen. And so that's the purview that, that, I, that I get to sit in, but it's certainly been a, 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 a tumultuous year. And, and as a result, I think um, what, as what happens lots of times when there's lots of change in a market, there's lots of opportunity, particularly for technology-based solutions that bring different things to the table. Yeah. Um, I, I'm based out of Washington, D.C. I think they could write a case study on what the Leonsis family has done with monumental sports and all the different ways that they have kind of modernized sports ownership, including gambling. I, I'm, I'm curious what your point of view is on gambling's influence on sports technology and content as we move forward. So uh, as you probably know, I'm on the board of DraftKings, and so and Revolution uh, had a big investment in, in DraftKings and has been involved with that company for a while, which is one of the big players in sports gaming here in the U.S. Uh, we also have an investment in a company called Sport Radar, which initially started in Europe. So we have uh, the perspective of, of, of both places. Um, so sports gaming, in terms of uh, its impact, you know, really – we're probably still in the very early innings here in the U.S. There's been a lot of talk about it over the last few few years, and more and more states every uh, month and quarter seem to be 
uh, launching uh, and approving and launching uh, an initiative there. We're starting to beginning to see uh, some of that activity. And uh, clearly, uh, I think there's no, de no, de no debating that the market for fans that want to engage with their sports and, and, and bet something on it is much broader than I think people thought. Um, there, there obviously has been sports betting for the beginning of time, since the beginning of time, and most of that was done illegally uh, for the last many years, and, and that's now starting to become in states like uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey and others that have legalized, uh, they're starting to see uh, the impact of that. So it's been a dynamic uh, 18 months in that industry. Um, and I think it's really just getting going. Do you think there is room for the teams and the leagues to, uh, and clearly they have these bold partnerships with DraftKings, FanDuel, some of the other uh, MGM, the casino operators um, around the country. Do you believe there's going to be room for them to carve out their own space here? Or do you believe that they'll remain in partnership with all of these gambling entities? My, my, I, I don't know, of course, but I think that they will never be an operator nor, nor sort of, as they say, handle the money. Um, so I think that, but there will be very creative ways and uh, that, and some of them have started to show how they will I embrace it. So I think the easy ones is, is something, some of the stuff that's been done to date with respect to sponsorships and partners. Uh, I think I read something this morning that, uh, uh, the Philadelphia 76ers decided their thing, each NBA team gets one sponsor they can put on their uh, jersey. And this year it's going to be crypto.com for the 76ers, huh. um, which, is, which is interesting yeah. and I think reflective of the times. Um, but, I, but I think there are other ways which the, the leagues and the teams will benefit from or get involved in the ecosystem, if you will. Uh, a, a simple example might be something like um, – what Monumental has actually done in D.C., where they've partnered with William Hill to actually build a right. uh, on-premise sports gaming facility right next to, connected to their arena. And if I'm sure you're familiar, given you're in the area, you know they envision that being a way to dr to to draw uh, fans into the arena, perhaps when the there are not games. So on a Sunday afternoon, if there's not a Caps or a Wizards game. They might be playing NFL football games uh, on the on the screens and serving hospitality and the like, and really turn their uh, venue into a in, into a giant sports book on some level. Yeah. So I think there can be some uh, uh, benefits there. I think you are also starting to see, um, you know, some of the gaming opportunities, not necessarily sports gaming, but like gaming related topics. So. NBA Top Shot and some of these other things seem to be all related to serving the same type of audience, which are these really interested and engaged fans. Um, so, okay, you've touched on blockchain. You know, I could see I could see Mark Cuban, you know, putting Dogecoin on the Mavericks, you know, uniform <laughs> at some point as well. Yeah. Um, gaming and esports have exploded in this younger generation um, as well. Um, could you kind of talk about where you think? The investment cycle is on that because that feels like the emerging marketplace that exists right now that could be used in and around sports. I think that I, I would agree with your assertion. And so I think they're in slightly different from what we can see. They're in slightly different parts of the cycle. Um, I think esports has now proven itself as a, a real operation where there will be real ecosystem built around it and they're starting to get some real visibility as to what the sustainable revenue streams are for those businesses what the business models are for the leagues and the teams within those how they compete with one another um, and, and the like so I, I I think that uh, eSports is starting to move into the you know it's 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 probably years away from being truly mainstream but I think it's being it's being accepted much more as this is no longer just uh, a handful of young millennials playing video games on Twitch. You know, this is now becoming real business. Um, so I think they're a little bit further along in their cycle, although, you know, for sure on the whole crypto and uh, NFT market, you know, there's been, there was another announcement yesterday uh, with a company called So Rare out of France that raised $600 million from my prior employer SoftBank, um, some of, we're seeing some of those companies going really from zero to 
extractions in a very short period of time. And some of the user metrics that we've seen with some of those companies, we've never seen with others um, in terms of the engaged user activity, the amount of uh, customers are acquiring over such a short period of time in the activity level, whether that's, you know, sustainable and durable, I think there's still some question to it. I think there's no question there's a real thing there, but I think we're in very early days of how that's going to sort itself out. I, I think we are talking about now the way Gen Z interacts with the world um, and using <laughs> that through sports as well and how they connect. And I, I think what you're touching on too, are we a ways away from esports being more mainstream? Sure. But they have massive audiences and they might not be That's streamlined, right. but they do. So is there a way to do that? And I think we're learning about this younger generation through all technology um, that there's going to be a new way to connect with them. So as you kind of see how sports teams are trying to, or leagues navigate, staying engaged with their fan base, what are you seeing right now? Yeah. It's, I mean, it started it was core to our thesis in, uh, in DraftKings, which was that the leagues and the teams wanted to figure out a way to be more engaged with their, uh, with their fan base and, and to give them things that, you know, wanted them to watch all nine innings or <coughs> all four quarters of a football game or one of those things. And what they were obviously seeing is that the opposite was happening. Some of particularly the younger uh, generation wasn't watching full games. I have uh, three sons, two of them are in college and one in high school. I'm not sure, and they're all uh, active athletes and, and sports fans. I'm not sure I've ever seen any of them watch a full football game, <laughs> but they'll watch the red zone for three hours That's with right. their friends with their fantasy sports uh, app open. So I think, it's, I, I, th I think we're beginning to see uh, that. So I think it started with fantasy sports and I think now it's moving into and I, obviously that's been, been been around for a while, but I think the daily fantasy made it uh, a little bit easier. So it wasn't just a team that you drafted in, in August that you were stuck with through February. Now the the brilliance of, of DraftKings and FanDuel and others was really creating this daily fantasy and then adding the, the monetary component on top of it for some gamification, uh, you know, uh, you could bet anything from a dollar to something much bigger than that. So there's a, a lot of sort of fun with that. And there were, I think the leagues were, have been seeing that people watch through the end of the fourth quarter now and it's created things like the red zone. And so I think fantasy start was really one of the big uh, entrants to that. But now we're seeing it with, you know, the Dapper Labs and NBA Top Shot uh, is another way in which leagues and teams are, thinking about how do they engage their fans in collectibles. So, so we, gr I grew up at least, I don't know if you did, but I grew up collecting baseball cards and some other things. I did. I think, right. And this generation is going to not grow up collecting baseball cards. They're growing up collecting NFTs and companies like autograph that is partnering with Tom Brady and others to create unique NFTs to put up on marketplaces. Um, these are ways in which they're, these leagues and teams are staying relevant. They're using their content differently. Um, I, I, another recent example, I don't know if you you watched the Monday Night Football uh, broadcast this week with the Manning yeah. mm -hmm. on the separate screen. Yep. I think that's another way that, that they're sort of saying maybe the younger generation doesn't want to engage in that kind of content in the way that traditionally has been done. So you know, what, for those that didn't see it, you know, the two Manning brothers, Eli and Peyton, um, were on one side of the screen and the regular ESPN feed for Monday Night Football was on the other side of the screen. And they were literally analyzing each play, kind of doing some jawing back and forth. They introduced different people uh, into the broadcast during the time, but it was a very different uh, show, if you will, than previously had been done. And I personally think they are I could see a, uh, a day in the not too distant future where maybe there's three or four different versions of that. There's your traditional Al Michaels. There's your Manning thing that's maybe very casual and fun about um, the folks that have played in the league. Then maybe there's one that's for gamers, you know, maybe uh, sports gamers. So maybe there's two uh, folks or three folks that are on, on the broadcast that are talking about, you know, the various prop bets that you might have or the, the a point spread for this quarter or how the stats are working really detailed, almost, um, uh, you know, advice or commentary along the way. And then I think and I could imagine another one that's 
where you're maybe there's even some coaching, right? Where people that are hardcore coaches or athletes, there's a there's a couple of real coaches talking about the real nitty gritty of the line blocking and the uh, play calling and those things. Um, and so, again, I think all these are creative ways in which the leagues and teams are starting to recognize they have valuable content, but it has to be monetized in ways that are different from the way they use it. This episode is brought to you by BlackBerry. The mobile handset BlackBerry is so famous for was powerful because it was secure. Today, it's pairing its trusted protection with artificial intelligence and bringing the security you held in your hand to everything you touch. BlackBerry Intelligent Security. Everywhere. Learn just how intelligent security can be at BlackBerry.com. We've hit a crossroads with that, and and I agree with you that it's going to be multiple different options to watch the same thing. Um, Twitter and other Discord or wherever else where people are going to watch a game with their friends or to monitor it in a different way matters. It's siphoned off audience. And so it actually... From the league's perspective, it, this is my point of view on this, but from the league's perspective, if they're going to command the type of money that they're going to command for rights fees, they have to embolden the rights holders to use the content in as many ways as possible and not lose audience share. And therefore, I'm with you on this, that they need to work in lockstep. Otherwise, it becomes so fragmented that the value of the package will eventually go down. That's my opinion of it. I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more. And, and so they can still get, the, if I think if they play their cards right and they allow for certain flexibility, I mean, think about five, if we were having this conversation five years ago, the notion of the NFL licensing their content to somebody that would have a two sports gaming experts talking about their game in real time about it while it was going on, I think it was zero. I mean, I think we, we'd say that there's no chance they would allow that. I think right now they're either already allowing it or they will very soon because ESPN will, to your point, say exactly the same thing, which is, hey, we can't pay you $5 billion for next year's um, uh, rights to the, to the Monday Night Football because – if, if we're only able to monetize it in this one traditional way, we have to do a couple of different ways to add up to what will be worth it for you. And, and places like the NFL, those leagues, I mean, they realize they're in the content, they're essentially in the content and media business. And so they've, I think they're, they've uh, embraced a lot of this and I would imagine it would continue to evolve. Right. And, and they have to protect their brand at the same time. So Correct. there's always going to be, a yep. someone comes along and they want to do NFL content and they're willing to pay a premium because they have these audiences in whatever platform is popular at the time. And I could see where that's attractive, but at the same time, the NFL has gone out of its way to protect the shield for years and years and years. They trust that whatever ESPN puts out there is going to fit within their content strategy. So Correct. we're in a really interesting space right now with rights, you know, with rights. And, um, and we'll, I think we'll see where it goes from here. I agree. Um, all right. So let me, uh, let's talk about some investment here. Like these days, pandemic, no pandemic, modern sports and sports technology. What are the VC firms looking for in a, in a successful sports related investment? Well, of course, different firms, different things. And when we think about sports tech, we think about this, you know, famous word that they've been saying since you and I were young professionals, which is convergence. I think we're finally have seen it, right? Which is sports and media and technology have finally converged to create opportunities in specific parts of the sports landscape, right? And, and so the way I, I look at it, and I think a lot of folks look at it is you have to break it down into, okay, there's a, there's different aspects of, of sports. There's teams, there's leagues. We've talked about that. There's athletes, there's fans, there's coaches, and that's sort of one layer. And then below that, there's actually different uh, ways in which those folks operate. There's a pro sports uh, element of that and pro coaching and the like. There's college, there's amateur, and then within amateur, there's a couple of different layers. And so I think, and then in and around all those, there are opportunities where technology, media, and sports have converged to create new opportunities. So, you know, I think that the one that everybody is talking about now is really around blockchain and uh, and NFTs, and those are getting a lot of the headlines, but there's still a lot, and, and, and rightfully so. I think it's a very disruptive 
uh, technology. I think it will, blockchain is, I think blockchain will uh, impact a lot of different pieces of the, the, the market, not just collectibles, which they've done with NFTs. And I think that's part of it. But I can imagine that it's, there's going to be a blockchain like solution if there isn't already um, impacting ticketing. You know, you think about the, the secondary ticketing market, it feels very much uh, prime for a blockchain like solution where you can verify ownership, they can track who's selling it. Oh, by the way, the leagues will like it uh, and the teams because they could participate in that value time. The teams have always scratched their head and said, I sell my best tickets to my best fans at a hundred or two hundred dollars a ticket, and if they don't want to go, they can sell the ticket for five hundred dollars. Why? Why is it that I don't uh, value uh, can can participate in that? And if you're on the blockchain, they can write the contract any way they want, where the teams may indeed participate in some of those secondary sales, which I, I suspect they will very much like. So I think NFTs and blockchain are getting a lot of uh, a lot of attention. Um, the, the, the headlines there would be Dapper Labs is one and, and So Rare is one, but there's a number of others and, and, you know, in related spaces that are not sort of pure sports, but are more esports. we're actually now seeing a number of, uh, companies that are creating real games on the blockchain and using NFTs as part of that to engage audience. And maybe they're sports related, or maybe they're pretty close to sports related, or a little bit more esports. Uh, but there, there's a big thing there. I think there's a lot of attention on, on esports. I think as it relates to uh, athletes, uh, there's a number of pieces of that, which is training, which comes into, you know, it, it attacks health and wellness. Uh, I think the first part of the health and wellness, I was on the board of Fitbit and saw the first part of health and wellness through automated devices like a Fitbit device or now um, sort of a higher end piece of that would be something like Whoop which tracks things like recovery and, and those types of things. Uh, there's, there's more and more technology around um, how, does one, uh, how does one nourish oneself if one is preparing for a match or whatnot. So I, I think the whole health thing is a really big uh, area and impacts sports materially. I think most, uh, pro certainly professional teams, if you look at the way they've set their organization, they now have a big health and wellness group within their organization. I'd say, I would guess 10 years ago, almost none of them did. And now they probably have big uh, staff that really use technology to make sure that their athletes are best trained, not just, you know, give them a piece of paper with their weightlifting uh, for the day, but really analyze what they, what they've done, what they haven't done, what they've been through, what their recovery system is and the like. So I think there's a lots of different pieces of it. We're seeing, you know, almost on a, weekly basis, a, a new idea around using technology to either augment something in sports, disrupt it, or create something new. All right, last thing for you. Um, we've talked a little bit here about um, the younger generation, and they connect differently, and it's hard to get them to watch full games, and we're trying to find ways uh, to keep them engaged, or not we, but the leagues and the teams, yeah. et cetera. Um, I'm curious if you have looked into, because we've talked to a lot of people about the in-game experience and modern stadiums and connectivity there and what needs to happen in a venue to draw a young crowd back into stadiums again. Have you looked into any of the technologies in modern stadiums? Uh, we have. Um, so we have an, it's, it's in a related area, but we have an investment in a company called Clear, which is known for its airport security. And a big growth area for them is now in venues and they do it. They, they, the, their application there, as, as an example, San Francisco giant stadium is a, is a couple of uh, phases that I think does help with some of the issues they're talking around, around engaging younger audiences, making it easier for them, making it more like what they're used to. So as an example, if at San Francisco giant stadium, your biometrics is tagged to your, uh, your Ticketmaster account. So you don't need to have a, put your phone out or anything, you just put your fingerprint down and it's tagged here and in you go. So easy in, in easy and safe, by the way, with, with pandemic these days, safe is part of it. So easy, quick, safe uh, entrance and exits from stadiums. That's part of it. But also with like a clear product, you can uh, order uh, and pay for um, uh, things through your biometrics or so concessions and the like. Um, 
but but yeah, so so I'd say clear is is one of the solutions that's I think helping the in-game experience. I think as you said, like there'll be I think there'll be more. We're starting to see some things around how do you entertain the audience in that's different right. ways. It used to be just the 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 folks come out and do a dance at halftime or or the the marching band comes in and I think there's other than for the local high school sports team, that's no longer good enough. Agreed. So, are there games that you can play? Is it a, is there a, there, there's all kinds of trivia contests or are there um, other activities that you can do? I, I suspect at some point it will, there'll be some involvement in, um, you know, different prizes that come out of that and the like. Um, and, and so I, I, there's no question that one of the things that's happened over the last 18 months is people have gotten used to just have, as people have gotten, we talked about this earlier, have been coming into the office. They're actually have gotten used to not coming back into uh, stadiums. And so uh, the, the team owners and leagues, I, I know for a fact, know that they need to make it a magnet for people to come back. And so things like what Ted and Monumental have done with the Capital One Arena in, in Washington is a good example. They've made that with their partnership with William Hill, a more attractive place for people to come, better food and beverage, more integrated, more mobile, more video, all those things. Steve Murray is the managing partner at Revolution Growth. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and and thank you for inviting me in. On the next Future Sport Podcast, the movement, it has never been more important than right now. When the pandemic hit, it really augmented our value from a nice to have, which is what I described just then, to more of a need to have because you need to know crowd management. You need to have line of sight into operational intelligence. That's Zach Klima, CEO of Wait Time, who is helping stadiums function safely and efficiently. That will do it for this episode. As always, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. <laughs>